Elder Snow, who I will uh, beg indulgence and call Steve from time to time. As I said, that's very refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is a friend uh, of uh, quite a number of years standing. In fact, uh, we met for the first time 50 years ago yeah. when we were both young missionaries for the church in North Germany. And then following uh, that experience, we met up here as students together at Utah State University and uh, had a particularly exciting and wonderful year together uh, on the uh, uh, staff of the campus newspaper. Now it's called The Statesman, but then it was called Student Life. And I was, uh, I was the editor and Steve was my business manager. Uh, that year, and uh, it was a great experience. Steve, Steve studied accounting and then went on to graduate uh, in 1974, 45 years ago, so it's appropriate that you're here for homecoming weekend, uh, and he's joined here today with his wife, Phyllis, who is also an Aggie, uh, who graduated in speech and language pathology, communicative disorders, and many members of their family and some of their fan club, uh, including Kem Gardner, who's a great friend of the school and has been a wonderful donor, and who's here with his granddaughter, Madison, who is an Aggie, uh, and Lou Kramer, who, although he's not an Aggie, is the son-in-law of one of the most distinguished Aggies of Utah State, uh, John Welch, who is 99 years old, and who we honored, uh, was it a year ago or two years ago? A year ago, a year ago uh, with an honorary doctorate. He's a graduate uh, of Utah State back in the 40s and went to Harvard Law School and then started a firm called Latham & Watkins. He was the number seven member of that firm, uh, and it's now a global firm uh, in, uh, in law and legal services throughout the entire, in, uh, entire world. So we've got some great Aggies here with us today. Uh, we're del delighted to welcome all of you uh, here today. I'll just say one or two things about uh, Elder Snow's uh, uh, ex uh, career. Uh, he, as I mentioned, he, he uh, graduated in accounting, then went to law school at, at BYU, started a firm called Snow Nuffer down in uh, southern Utah in St. George. It grew to be a firm of about 40, uh, 25 uh, attorneys around the state. Uh, his service as a, a leader in the community was uh, actually very, uh, he was very quick to be called upon for the service. He served as a bishop uh, in the church, as a stake president in the church. Uh, but then uh, he began getting invitations to serve in, in statewide uh, uh, roles. With Kim Gardner, he served on the, on the Board of Regents uh, for the state which is the body that has the governing responsibility for all of higher education and later became chairman of that board. He was also a member and chair of the Grand Canyon Trust. He's an environmentalist and a conservationist. Uh, and uh, he also served as uh, chairman of Western States Commission on Higher Education. And uh, as, as a member of President Obama's Commission on Faith and Neighborhoods, I think is that. Faith-based. Faith-based uh, initiatives. Uh, in uh, uh, following uh, his service as a stake president in St. George, he was called to be mission president of the San Bernardino Mission. And then as a local, or a, a general authority 70 for Southern Utah, the south part of, uh, southern part of Utah, and at age 51, when his legal career was really starting to click, he was called to be a full-time general authority. And he and Phyllis were given the assignment to go to Africa. And they were in Johannesburg for four years. Uh, he came back from, they came back from that assignment. He became a, uh, one of the presidents of the first quorum of the 70, and in 2012 became church historian and recorder and uh, has just been released from that role at the end of August, or in, will it be in October? Officially a uh, conference in October, yeah, but conference in effectively October. August 1st. So. And uh, uh, 
I can tell you that it's, uh, I don't know how you have experienced, he will turn 70, I don't think it's a secret, he will turn 70 in November. He's much older than I am. I, I don't turn 70 until December. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know what your experience, Steve, is in thinking about turning 70, but the, the concept of confronting 50 years of, of a life, you know, has really been kind of, uh, kind of disorienting for me. And, and so I, uh, I thought we'd bring this picture back today. Uh, <laughs> see, see how, how that goes over this. See if you can pick out Elder Snow on this, this lineup of these four odd people here. It looks like uh, some members of the Grateful Dead. Or yeah, it, it does. <laughs> these are the guys that, that Steve and I used to hang out with. Uh, on student life, and there, there you have him, second from the left. Uh, this is post-mission experience, by the way, post-mission, uh, his sideburns and his flower power shirt. Uh, so just in case you were being too intimidated by Elder Stephen Arastus Snow here, I thought we would kind of break the, break the uh, ice I a little bit. I thought that was so, lost to... Uh, yes, uh, no, I actually went over to the archives yesterday and dug that out. <laughs> it did take me an hour to find it, but we did find it in the May 15th, 1972 issue of Student Life. So, at any rate, uh, with that, let's open up the, the conversation, Stephen, and, and, and I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit about, you know, your experiences as a student, but with the benefit of 50 years of hindsight and, and, and ask you what was going through your mind in 1972 as you thought about and contemplated the next 50 years? Well, uh, first of all, I think looking back on life in terms of decades rather than weeks and months makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. And uh, you can see some of those things you worried a lot about and fussed about they just tend to work out. And uh, I, I, I personally like to look back because it, uh, you know, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense and order as you were going through it. But as you look back, it, mm -hmm. it does make much, a lot more sense. Phyllis and I have talked about this, my wife Phyllis and I, and it just seems like um, the events of our life, lives have swung on very small hinges. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure we, planned or, you know, expected life to turn out the way it has. It's been great. We've loved it, but it's not what we expected. And, and my counsel's always been, you know, to have plan B in your shirt pocket and plan C in your back pocket. And uh, many times we've had to go to plan B, uh, plan C, actually. So, but it's turned out great. It's been uh, wonderful. This is where we started our life together as uh, a couple. I came up from uh, St. George. Phyllis was from St. George, but always already enrolled in a master's program here. And so I was really thinking about the University of Utah. And she said, if you, if you want to marry me, you're going to become an Aggie. Thank and you, Phyllis. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I've never, ever regretted that. I just love my experience here at uh, at Utah State and love to come back and just feel reminded of the feelings that we felt as young I, students. I love that comment that you make that, that uh, life often turns on, on pivots, uh, small, what were seemingly small decisions at the time. Uh, uh, can you describe some of those the pivots that you, you went well, through? Well, decisions uh, about coming here, yeah. uh, decision about going to law school at BYU. Again, I was planning to go to Utah. I was accepted first at Brigham Young, and I remember sending in, you had to send in $50 with your acceptance letter that you'd, you were coming, and then 10 days later, I got my acceptance to Utah Law School, University of Utah Law School, and I thought, you know, if I accept and go to Utah, I'm going to lose that $50 <laughs> I've sent to Brigham Young. So I went to BYU. It worked, it worked out great. <laughs> and that's where you met Lou Kramer. Yeah. Well, we met in the mission field. That, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Lou was also in Germany. Yeah. But he was a, a year ahead of you, I think, at BYU Law School. Right. Yeah. He yeah. was in the charter class. 
We're referred to as second class. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, as you started out your career in law and, and, your, and your friend, Judge Nuffer, who uh, was your partner. Well, he and I uh, knew first the way it's pronounced, although it's spelled Nuffer. Uh -huh. we, we started with, uh, I was prosecuting with the county and also back then you could have a private practice. I was associated with the firm there and he joined that same small firm. And uh, we just thought after a time that we might do better out on our own. And, and so in 1979, we formed uh, Snow and Nuffer. And uh, it's wor it worked out great. He's now uh, chief federal judge for the U District of Utah and has had a very distinguished legal career. And he was just a wonderful partner. We spent 24 years together, and I don't remember ever having a disagreement with him. We just really enjoyed one another's company. One of my uh, guests uh, a couple years ago here in the Leadership Forum was a partner of mine at the firm that we started in Boston. Uh, and he was a former professor at Harvard Business School, a colleague of mine, a fellow by the name of Richard Hammermesh. And in the 25 years that we were partners together, we didn't have a single argument about money or, frankly, anything else. Yeah. And the, 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 it's, talk a little bit about the significance of having a good partner in business. Well, I think just surrounding yourself with good people is one key to success uh, and finding people that you want to associate with, that you'd like to work with, that you respect, that, that you are friends with. Not that you need to do everything socially together, but people that you respect and get along with, I think are very important. And I always tried to find people smarter than me, which wasn't too hard, by the way, but it was just, uh, uh, in most of, most areas where I've worked, I've, I've just been fortunate to be associated with some very bright people. And uh, so I think sometimes that's overlooked, uh, you know, when we think about our careers, but you want to, I enjoyed going to work every day. I loved my law practice. I loved, you know, driving to work. I just couldn't wait to get there, which is, seems strange. Most, many lawyers would not agree with that, mm -hmm. but I just loved helping people solve problems and and, uh, Say a little them. bit more about that. What was it about uh, the practice of law that uh, was satisfying to you, and how did you get interested in that in the first place? Well, I, I've told the story before, but I was 14, um, and I joined the Columbia Record Club. And you could get 10 albums for a, re for a penny. They'd send them to you. And so I, it came out in Saturday Evening Post or something, so I clipped the coupon, sent it in, and sure enough, uh, 10 albums showed up. And my mother started to wonder what was going on, and I explained to her that this was fine. I had it under control until the, a bill came for $84, which back then was more than a month's worth of groceries at our house, and my mother just panicked because I must have missed a... You know, he had to buy an album like every month, and I must have missed that. So they billed me for all the albums. And I was panicked, so I did something that I don't think my folks had ever done, or nobody I knew had ever done. I called an attorney and uh, asked if I could meet with them. That was your idea? Yeah. And so I went At into... At age 14. Yeah, I was uh, in trouble. I was in big trouble. And uh, so I met with F. Clayton Nelson, who was uh, one of like three attorneys in St. George at the time. And I, he said, bring in your paperwork. And, you know, I didn't have much, one or two little scraps of paper. And he invited me in his office. He was quite a character, took a drag from his cigarette and looked over what I had and told me to bundle up those records, send them back, and with a letter in my own hand explaining that I'm only 14 and I can't legally enter into any contract with them. And so... Uh, and that solved my problem. That solved your problem. You and never I heard, just you didn't hear like, from Columbia. No, I never heard from Columbia after that. It just felt like this huge burden was lifted from my shoulders. And I remember him walking me out of the office, and I said, what, what do I owe you? Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, you, know, you just, just kind of you take care of somebody sometime. And I always remember that, and I remember the feeling that I had when he had uh, helped me through that. But to me, it was a big problem, and so I that motivated me to help others in the, in the law. So 
that was what, one what reason. was it like starting out as an attorney in St. George in 1978? Well, it was a small town. Yeah. So I was like the, maybe the ninth or tenth attorney in town. So it was a small, very collegial group of attorneys. We knew each other. It was a fun area to practice. But most problems were not big problems. There were little cases, boundary disputes or, uh, you, you know, water issues or just little things that people in small towns deal with. Yeah. And it was just uh, divorces, of course. And so I did a little bit of everything, um, which I enjoyed. I was kind of the generalist of the bunch. As we grew, we specialized a lot more with people we brought in. But it, I just found it very refreshing in a small in a small practice in a small yeah. town to help to help my neighbors. As I recall, friends. John Huntsman's brother was practicing law down yeah. in St. George. Mm -hmm. Blaine was, was Blaine, there as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Steve, uh, you uh, started to branch out. Your firm started to branch out a little bit outside, uh, outside of St. George too, didn't it? Did it, did it grow uh, to other parts of Utah? Well, we, we started the firm at a very uh, interesting time. It was the time St. George started to grow. Yeah. And uh, as, as the town grew, we, we, more and more work came our way, so we started to grow. And Salt Lake firms, firms from out of town, were wanting to establish an office in St. George. And we thought, well, why don't we look at establishing a Salt Lake office, which we did with uh, one of my former classmates at law school. And, uh, Turned out to be very successful, and so uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun. It worked out. Now, t talk a little bit about getting involved in community uh, affairs. And uh, I've mentioned extensively your, your, your church experience, but how about the Grand Canyon Trust and then getting involved with uh, higher education in the state? Uh, well, I've always been environmentally minded, so uh, that was a... Uh, nice opportunity to ask to join the Grand Canyon Trust, which does conservation work on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, they're headquartered in Flagstaff, and I just really enjoyed that. I went on, I think, the late 80s or early 90s, and uh, it just enjoyed my time with them, served as chairman for a time. Went out as mission president, came back, and was put back on the board. And interestingly enough, after 18 years being with the church, they've asked me to come back again. So that's the only official assignment I have right now is to be on their board. Um, so that was the other. Uh, was it, let me just ask this, was it controversial? Did they take controversial positions? Uh, yeah, sure. How did you work your way through those kinds of things? What were some examples maybe? Well, we focused a lot on power plants, coal-fired power plants, and you know the the history on that has been a transition to gas, uh, natural gas, for a lot of these large plants, and some of them have closed, as they should, should, in my opinion, should have done. They really were polluting some of our grandest sites in the country, you know, like the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. other places. So we worked a lot on that. We tried to work on community initiatives within towns to help them. Uh, maybe steer towards less environmentally sensitive or, or, or more environmentally sensitive uh, areas of focus in their business and economics. Uh, so it, it was very rewarding. How important, in your opinion, is uh, environmental conservation? Well, you know, God has given us this wonderful place to live, and we should return it after we've spent our time here, we should return it at least as good a shape as it was when we arrived, and hopefully better. So I think we have great responsibilities here, stewards, to take care of uh, this beautiful place that we've been given. Yeah. Uh, I asked about higher education. Could you sp spend just a few minutes on, on your, your experience as a member of the Board of Regents in higher education? and? what you've seen over the years in terms of Utah's higher education profile? Well, I got involved uh, at the uh, imitation of Governor Matheson uh, back in 1983. He invited me to come on the board. Kim Gardner was chairman at the time. Learned a lot about uh, running meetings by watching uh, 
Kim. He's very efficient and a uh, nice combination of humor and uh, just moving through things. Uh, I've been involved. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of opportunities in the state of Utah for a Democrat because there's not many of us. So it's interesting you brought up that word. Uh, <laughs> I think you've just outed yourself. Yeah, I have. Uh, but I was active in politics, and we had invited the governor down often to, for appearances and talks and ride in the rodeo parade, that kind of thing, and uh, got to know him quite well. I really loved uh, uh, Scott and Norma Matheson. We just lost Norma here a few months ago. They were just grand people, and... Uh, uh, Anyway, after uh, I was pretty young, I was 33, Kim, I think, was 41 at the time. So we were, uh, you know, there, was, uh, there were people on the board that were our parents' age. Mm -hmm. And so it was an interesting time. The, these were times when they were choosing university presidents that were young, uh, like David Gardner and uh, Jeff Holland were both in their late 30s when they... Mm -hmm went on as, as presidents of uh, BY, Elder Holland, BYU, and of course, David Gardner at Utah. So it was a time where uh, there was a trend to go maybe a little younger. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, I was probably one of the beneficiaries of that. But it was very enjoyable. Uh, obviously, higher ed today as much has, has grown considerably. It'd be hard for me to even comment on what's happened the last uh, 30 something years since I was called to the board, uh, asked to be on the Board of Regents. I served until 94 when I yeah. left for a full time mission president assignment. But yeah. we rotated around the campuses of the state, which I found just very interesting to learn about places like Ephraim, Snow College, and back then it was College of Eastern Utah and Price, some of the challenges that they faced. And yet we still had these research universities like Utah and Utah State that were, we still had, we had governance over. So it was a very mixed bag of responsibility as far as higher ed goes. Right. Uh, you know, here at the Huntsman School, we've adopted a strategic objective to become the premier undergraduate business and economics program in the Intermountain West. Uh, and uh, that's a bold, audacious goal we don't expect to uh, get there anytime soon. Uh, when we accomplish that goal, we'll take on the Pacific Coast, of course. But right now, we're just focused on the Intermountain West. But our, our objective is to create an undergraduate experience that will allow our students to compete with anybody, wherever they've been uh, uh, trained, and go on to the very finest graduate schools, graduate programs in the world. And, and uh, uh, we feel very passionate about that and uh, uh, very excited and very engaged around that. And we, of course, are dealing with some terrific, terrific undergraduate students uh, here at the campus. When you were here at Utah State, what did you think about the experience you had as a, 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 you know, in terms of your education and how it prepared you for the I, lifetime? I felt like the education I got here was equivalent to uh, any undergraduate experience mm -hmm. in, the, in the West. Uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of options. Uh, I worked my way through school, and so I was looking at in-state uh, programs, of course. And I felt like when I finished my accounting program here, I could have gone in with any accounting firm in the country. Jim Quigley was a classmate. You know, you know what Jim's done. He's, so I just felt like we had excellent instruction, excellent uh, professors, small classes. I was here when Larzette Hales first came. Uh, she was my intermediate accounting professor. Uh, it was just, I just felt we had a very, we were very well prepared for the future. For the benefit of our students here, uh, when you go outside, you'll see some magazines, uh, Huntsman Business magazines, and I encourage you to pick up one and take a look at it. There's a page in there on Larzette Hale. Uh, who was the first black woman CPA in America to receive a PhD and the first black person of either gender to become a department head of a school of accountancy 
at any major university in America, and that was here, Utah State. She was uh, head of our department for 13 years. And you mentioned Jim Quigley. Jim Quigley, a classmate of uh, Steve's uh, in our accounting program then, uh, went on to become the chief executive officer of Deloitte Touche Tomatsu, the largest professional services firm in the world, uh, on the strength of one degree, his bachelor's degree in accounting from Utah State University. He tells a story about Larzette Hale, where it may even have been in the class you were in, but Steve, or the way he tells the story, he, he got the highest grade on the, on the exam in the class, but Professor Hale gave him an A minus in the class. And he went to see her afterwards and say, well, can you help me understand this? And she said, well, Mr. Quigley, did you do your very best work in my class? <laughs> and he said, well, I did the best job on the exam. Said, That's not the question I asked you. Did you do your very best? And he had to admit that he kind of sat back in class and didn't really participate that much. And she called him out on it and said, look, uh, wherever you go, whatever you do, you need to take your A game and do your very best. And he said it had a profound impact on him throughout the remainder of his career. And uh, I guess so. I just think this was a great experience here. And I think sometimes when you think of Logan and not a large metropolitan area, but it's got one of the finest universities in the country. Yeah. And I, I think our students that come from here can compete with anyone anywhere. One of the things that we hear often about from employers about our students is that they're very well trained, but they're also, they bring with them two other uh, attributes that uh, they really appreciate. One is that they're humble, and two is that they work hard. Uh, and uh, that's not a bad brand no. to have either. Well, it probably reflects the profile of your student body, of course. Yeah. Uh, we've talked a little bit about higher education and your, your work in, in environmental politics. What about your experience now as a general authority of the church. You became a mission president down in St. George and then were called uh, uh, following that experience. Was it immediately following that experience or did you come back as a lawyer for a while? I, I worked about three and a half years as an attorney before. Okay. And then you, then you were called to Africa. T tell us a little bit about the Africa experience. Well, nothing had prepared us for that uh, you know, Africa was probably 75th on my list of places to visit. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't tell you uh, without probably getting emotional what a wonderful experience it was. First of all, the people are absolutely incredible. And uh, I think if we're judged uh, on the same standard, uh, I, uh, I could be in big trouble. I mean, these are wonderful, faithful people. And uh, of course, I was there in a, an ecclesiastical role. Mm -hmm. And so we, we visited uh, a lot of our congregations throughout Africa. And it was, uh, it was just a tremendous experience. First of all, it's a terrific continent. It's a great place to visit. And uh, you were the, headquartered in Johannesburg. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many countries in Africa did you? We were responsible for 28 countries. 28 countries. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And did you get to visit all of those countries? Somewhere, Somalia was on our list, and that was a no-go area. Yeah. And uh, Rwanda, Burundi were still, mm -hmm. it's pretty fresh from the genocide. So yeah. uh, the church hadn't reestablished itself when I was there yet, yeah. back in those countries. What's happened in Africa so far as the church is concerned? Uh, very strong growth. Uh, I think, uh, y y you know, they're so accepting of... Uh, the gospel message that, that you can, one of our challenges is to, is, to, is to grow from centers of strength so that we, we have leadership available to, to help the new converts. You can go into parts of Nigeria, Ghana, and you can baptize a ward in a month if you wanted, but the challenge is having people there to lead and take care of the congregations. We have a program here uh, at the Huntsman School called the SEED program, Small Enterprise Economic Development Program, and we uh, send students to various parts of the developing world where they spend a semester and teach principles of entrepreneurship 
uh, and help small entrepreneurs actually become more successful. One of those places is Ghana, actually. So we have students in Ghana right now. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity for those that take advantage of that. And it's a great help to, uh, to, to the local citizenry. They, there's not a lot, but a lot of job opportunities. It's not like you can apply at the factory and go to work. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them uh, have to rely on their own, starting their own business, you know. So this micro business uh, opportunities in Africa are, are really where many people have had to go. Yeah. Uh, of course, South Africa, where you were stationed, uh, went through a phenomenal experience when apartheid ended and Nelson Mandela became the president. And I don't think he was president when you were there. I think he had already no. stepped down, isn't that right? But That's right. What was that, what was that like, the, observing that leadership of Nelson and Mandela? His successor, successor was Mbeki, who was the president when I arrived, and uh, continued on that tradition. Uh, it's, it's always going to be a country with challenges simply because of the, uh, of the past. You know, that's it's probably going to take them another generation or so to iron things out. Uh, they had a little trouble with Jacob Zuma, who replaced Mbeki. But seem, th seem thing, uh, things seem to be going better now with the, the new president. Uh, but it's a wonderful country, probably the bright star of Africa as far as yeah. economics and... When you, did you visit Robben Island? Uh, yes, uh -huh. where uh, uh, Mandela was uh, imprisoned off 20, the coast 20, of twenty-seven Cape Town. years. Yeah, uh, it, it's to me, it's a remarkable. And his uh, what was his book called? Long Path to Freedom, or something mm -hmm. like that. Long Walk to Freedom. Long Walk to Freedom uh, is remarkable to me to think about uh, his history, the um, brutal regime that he uh, suffered under. And yet, when he came out of prison, he wanted to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission so that the country could heal its wounds and come back together again. Right. You'd think he'd want revenge for that terrible suffering he went through for all those years, but he was really much more into forgiveness and yeah. moving forward. Yeah. A remarkable leadership principle. While we're talking about leadership, can you... Talk to us a little bit about leaders that you've known and, and the imprint and the uh, sort of example or lessons that you might have learned from some of these leaders. Oh, I've had the opportunity to be influenced by some wonderful people in life. Uh, I remember uh, associating with uh, uh, President Rolf Kerr when he was president of Dixie College and worked with him on a number of committees. Really admired his style of... Uh, Formerly bringing... assistant to the president here at Utah State. Right, exactly. That's where he began, was up here. And he had a great ability to bring people together, and, uh, uh, and I, I enjoyed that. As I said, I served with Cam Gardner, had a chance to observe him and some of the great things he's done. and. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the list's too long to name, but I've, I've had some great mentors, some great examples in leadership. Name a president of the Church of Jesus Christ that you were particularly influenced by. Oh, I think Gordon Hinckley. Probably and what president was it Hinckley. about President Hinckley that you admired in particular? Uh, how bright he was, uh, how knowledgeable he was about the issues, and uh, just insightful and didn't, didn't labor over things. He made a decision and really moved forward. You know, obviously we think of uh, the decisions he's made from that affected the whole church, but there's decisions every day administratively uh, with the large, large organization that the church is, and he was very effective, very influential, and uh, did his homework and it was just, uh, just a joy to, to serve under. Uh, who was it that asked you to be the uh, church historian? Uh, President Monson. That was President Monson. President Irene, President Uchtdorf. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the uh, mandate or mission that, that they gave you in that calling. Well, uh, it's always been a part of the church. Uh, Section 21 of our, of our Holy Scripture, Doctrine and Covenant, says that 
begins with there shall be a record kept among before there before uh, behold there shall be a record kept among you and I think the leaders of the church have taken that charge very seriously and uh, and President Hinckley in particular during his time was very interested in the history of the church and uh, as a result was willing to support things like the new church history library which is really uh, top-notch as far as uh, uh, that type of facility and uh, wonderful archives. And uh, he, it, it's just, history plays a great role in our church because we look back and see what others have done and that gives us hope and courage to do hard things like they did. You know, you, you mentioned that Africa was not on the top of your expected list <laughs> of assignments. How about being church historian? Well, I'm an attorney by training. I'm not a trained historian, obviously. The only trained historian who has been church historian is, of course, Leonard Arrington, again from Utah State University. All of the other church historians have been lay mm -hmm. individuals that come from varying, varied backgrounds. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith served 49 years, uh, but you know, going way back and in, even into the 19th century. Uh, most of the time during uh, the history of the church, the historian's been a member of the Twelve or the First Presidency even with Anthon Lund. But since 19... Anthon uh, Lund also has a Utah State connection. It, it's right. This I mean, building it's, actually uh, is built on the space that used to be Anton Lund that's Hall. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, it's not unusual to have lay people as historians, but it's not anything I expected. I was pretty happy in my, my, my other assignment, but I have loved, I loved being the church historian. It was great. Well, your middle name is Erastus. Tell us about Erastus Snow. Well, he joined the church in Vermont in, uh, at an early age. Wanted to see where, the... Where in Vermont was he? St. Johnsbury, New St. Johnsbury. Vermont, mm -hmm. and wanted, uh, as a teenager, wanted to meet Joseph Smith, went to Nauvoo, and uh, kind of grew up there with leaders of the church, uh, was in the first company to come west to Salt Lake. He and Orson Pratt were the first to ride into the valley, and uh, later he was called back to Scandinavia as a mission president in Denmark, and so greatest body of early saints who joined the church next to the British Isles. The saints from Britain, of course, were from Scandinavia. And there's Scandinavian roots here in this valley and San Pete Valley. So you run into a lot of Andersons and Jensens and uh, people that have uh, roots from Scandinavia. So he served there for three plus years and then eventually was assigned to lead the the group that went down to settle St. George. And you also, I remember a talk you gave in general conference some years ago about those that went down to the hole in the rock. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, that was a little bit later, 1879. Uh, they started, it was kind of a, they wanted to establish a presence in the southeastern part of the state because it was a lot of miners and outlaws even were coming into that area and there was a lot of concern about it. And so uh, their scouting on the route had not been too good, but they ended up uh, east of Escalante there at the rim of uh, the canyon with the Colorado, realizing that they were they had a huge job to get down. No one had really appreciated what it was gonna to take to get across the river. And they got snowed in and really had no option but to continue on. And so it's a great story about how they uh, build a road down to the river through the hole in the rock. And of course that story was repeated over and over again as they made their way to Bluff, Utah. And uh, just an incredible story of tenacity and Did you have some faith. relatives in that group? Uh, distant relatives, uh -huh. not close, yeah. but I just think it's a wonderful story. One of the last great colonizing efforts, uh, 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 I mean, real challenging colonizing efforts, hard to get there and hard when they arrived. Yeah. 
Final comment, and then I'd like to open it up for questions in the audience. So if you'd like to be thinking about questions you'd like to ask Elder Snow. Uh, the, uh, uh, when you think about the progress of the uh, church history department under your leadership, uh, I think of the tremendous flowering of, uh, of research that's been done. I think you've got something like 250 historians working with 250 you. 250 employees. Employees. Yes. Uh, there have been numerous uh, white papers that have been written on controversial subjects in the history of the LDS Church that have uh, been really welcomed by a large group of, of people both inside and outside the church uh, for their veracity and historical accuracy and candor. And then, of course, there's this big project that you've had underway, four-volume uh, narrative history of the church uh, called Saints. Uh, and uh, the first volume has been published and uh, sold widely. And I think uh, the second one's being serialized now. And I'm it'll not sure when it'll be. February it'll be, February it'll be out. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your feelings about the opportunity to lead and preside over this great work that's being done. I think uh, one of the events that really helped all of this take place was the Joseph Smith Papers, which was originally funded, an idea that uh, the Larry Miller fund, uh, family funded, along, of course, with the church. And uh, those uh, volumes are, are, I think there's about 17, 18 volumes out now. They're scholarly type volumes, good, uh, wonderful resource about the life of Joseph and uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's wonderful. And I think in doing all that research, uh, we learned a lot about that period of time of the church. And that helped us with the gospel topics essays, which you mentioned, the white papers, you called them, uh, helped us really understand some of the, the, the episodes in our history that have been sensationalized by others. And we were able to look at them more uh, very closely and interpret them, of course, from a faith-based perspective. And uh, really, when folded into the huge story, or the bigger story, they seem pretty insignificant. So that work has really helped us with tackling difficult questions head on, and that led to the Gospel Topics essays, I think then more support for the four-volume narrative history of the church which I think has been well, re the first volume has been very well received. The second volume I've read equally as good. I'm looking forward to being published. Uh, so we've just had a lot of support from uh, a lot of people within the department and without. You have an outstanding uh, scholar here and Patrick Mason, who's, who's joined the university here uh, on the Mormon Studies Chair. Leonard Arrington Chair. The Len excuse me, Leonard Arrington Chair. and. Uh, you know, we just have some wonderful historians, both in and out of the church history department. It's been a real time of uh, more openness. Uh, we've tried to make our collection more accessible to, uh, to scholars and students of, of, of church history. And I think that's worked out well. We've also, as you pointed out when we, just before the forum, we've, we've really emphasized a global history by taking uh, oral history interviews of people around the world, early members of the church in various countries around the world. It's been a great thing, too. Is there a particular anecdote uh, that might have uh, come out in the writing of the saints that you uh, are particularly drawn to or can remember that you'd like to share? Well, it's uh, my observation is it took Joseph about 65 working days to translate the Book of Mormon. It took us six years to get the first volume of, uh, of the uh, history out. Of course, Joseph didn't have to worry about correlation or <laughs> all the things we deal with. So it's, uh, I, I think getting the, the history approved and having everyone sign off, you, you know, everybody from correlation to, we wanted it to be accepted by seminaries and institute, we wanted it to be used by them. And uh, it was quite a, 
quite an exercise to get it done. <laughs> so. uh, to say the least. Let's uh, take a few minutes and open it up for any questions that uh, anybody might care to ask. We've got a microphone that we can pass around. Ready? Get, get, get a mic right over here and then state your name and, and uh, ask your question, if you would, please. Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy Zabel, and I had a question to let us know. So in your opinion, what would be the most influential leadership trait to have? I think curiosity and a willingness to learn and uh, not to just do things the same way we've always done, but to listen and, and learn. And I think it's just an inherent curiosity about how we might do things better. And uh, again, I mentioned, but hang around bright people, good people. You know, make sure you're surrounded by good people in whatever you do. Okay. Other questions? I'll ask a question. Um, my name's Levi. Uh, you've had a lot of experiences in your life where it seems you were planning on going one direction and an opportunity arrives where you end up going some other direction. I feel like that's a concern for a lot of students. Most of us think we have this picture of where we're going to go. 80% of us are going to go another direction. What is the advice you would give to us to deal with those situations where there is a pivot in life? so that we can be optimistic and positive and leverage that for our benefit? Well, I think that's just part of life, and uh, you're always going to be surprised. It's not ever going to work out just the way you think it's going to. And I think live your life in a way that you can react. You know, I think a lot of people, one thing I've learned, a lot of people sometimes get so bogged down with debt, they don't. They limit their options to do other things if opportunities were to arise. So I think that's important to, to just keep your options open because it's never ever going to work out quite the way you think. It's going to be wonderful, don't misunderstand. It's going to be terrific. You're going to love it, but it's not going to be what you thought it was. And yet, looking back, it all makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. It's, that's yeah. why I like, that's the only thing I like about getting older, is <laughs> looking back. Um, so when you were talking about your different experiences, it sounded like a lot of times, and still does sound like a lot of times, people are reaching out to you to come and work for them, whether that be the Grand Canyon Trust or the church, They're, they have like positions and they give you opportunities. So what do you think in your personal opinion, makes you stand out so much and makes you so valuable to That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. Well, I'm six foot four. That's <laughs> probably one reason. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I just think uh, if you get in and do your best, I, you know, half of it is just showing up and making a difference uh, when you serve. And look for opportunities to serve outside your, your profession or career because I find those experiences very, very meaningful and I think they make life much more interesting. And I think if you do your best and are good at it, other opportunities will come your way. Uh, Kim, let me, get, let me get a microphone down here, Kim. Kim, why don't you comment on that? What do you think caused people to... Uh, be attracted to Steve Snow. <laughs> this is Kem Gardner. Uh, well, Who, I never have really liked the guy. I'm <laughs> 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 yeah, very, very jealous. Uh, actually, Steve and I are related through the Crosbys and the Gardners, and so we think of ourselves more as relatives and, and not just friends. But uh, clearly, We've been friends for a lot of years, and that's because I find him so intellectually stimulating and fun to be around. He's a bright guy. You like to play golf with him, too. Well, I did until he started beating me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was, I, this is, I'd rather talk about me than Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I was thinking about his answer of, uh, being curious and being open to new ideas and possibilities and so forth. Because I, I started out really more in real estate. And then uh, 
went into some of the energy in the Uinta Basin and several energy companies, and now I've gone big on renewable energy. Yeah. And at the same time, I've gotten heavily involved in fiber and, you know, and involved in First Digital, which is a fiber internet company. And, but I mean, there's just so many opportunities. And I, my advice is don't close yourself off because there, were, there are, I wished I was young uh, and I knew what I knew now, yeah. I know now. Yeah but because there's just so many opportunities out there and you don't want to just pick a profession and close your mind off. Yeah. Uh, I'm working with Lou right now, which is really difficult uh, <laughs> on, a, on, a very, on a very major project uh, in which we're trying to even start the first solar project where, where we'll do a large project of, of uh, I mean, we're all thinking that in 12 years, there's the tipping point and that we've got to reduce the carbon footprint. And so we're trying to start a large solar uh, community out in the heart of the Salt Lake Valley where all the offices and the apartments and so forth will be all uh, you know, run by renewable energy. And those ideas are coming and coming very strong. And I'm just saying, uh, that's what I admire so much about him is he never yeah. closed himself off. I mean, the brethren had him as uh, president of the as the president of the seventy, where he would have gone into the twelve, and yet what they needed at that time was his mind and his his temperament to deal with issues. Temperament, I think, is a really important that thing that he could get through the gospel topics. They sent him over with the objective to take on all the difficult issues yeah. and uh, get them written up and presented and get them through the 12 so, yeah. that, so that they had a, an official church position yeah. on difficult issues that had never been dealt with before. And the same thing with the church history, to get an accurate history of the church. His legacy will be known for years and years and years to come. I want to pick up on this point, temperament, Kim, because uh, Steve's too modest to say this, but uh, most people that know him know him as one of the kindest, nicest people. Just bit, go back to the question this young woman asked about why did people seek out Steve Stowe for these positions of leadership? And I'm going to ask Lou Kramer to talk about temperament. Lou, Lou was another one of these guys that met Steve 50 years ago. So Lou, stand up a little bit. This, this is the former head of the World Trade Center for Utah, Lou Kramer, uh, appointed by Governor Huntsman. It's entirely appropriate that he's here. So talk a little bit about Steve Snow's, Bruder Snow's Schnee. Bruder Schnee, in yeah. German language. <laughs> and from the minute you meet Steve Snow, you want to be friends with Steve. And I spent most of my career in Washington, D.C., and when I would come back here, I'd want to see Kim Gardner, Steve Stowe, just because I know I'd be laughing for the whole time because there's so many fun things happening. And I think a cheerful countenance is important. The, the Savior yeah. said, be of good cheer. This man is of good cheer, and he makes everyone else feel that same way. So you want to be around people like that. Uh, he said 50% of life is showing up. Woody Allen said 80% of life is showing up. But you've got to show up and be with somebody that they want to be with. And that's what Kim, in particular, it's Steve. So Kim's sister was also in our mission in Germany. You're going to hear a lot about North Germany. In fact, those pictures of the four people up there with those two Grateful Dead guys on the left. <laughs> and the one on the right was Von Stocking, who was also in our mission. That's right. So, uh, but hanging out two years in North Germany trying to convince ex-Nazis of Christianity doesn't make you a very uh, cheerful guy unless you're a Steve Snow or a Doug Anderson or Kim's wonderful sister Suzanne was a missionary there with us too. And Kim keeps saying that Suzanne and I were companions. We weren't companions, but we were in the same areas together. So even in North Germany, we had some standards. Anyway, Steve's temperament, willingness to listen, and his beautiful wife Phyllis. It's a great combination. You want to be with Steve, Kim, and Doug, and, and not so many North German ex-Nazis. <laughs> did, did you see Carl come in in the back there? It's Car Carl White. Our wonderful professor of psychology here also was in those in Berlin walking through those streets. This is Carl White, distinguished professor in the College of Education in the back. 
Get a microphone back there to Carl White. Let's get a also microphone back. Also six foot five or yeah. four. Somebody got a microphone they can run back to Carl. I was six foot five until I met Kim Gardner. Yeah. Let's see what Carl has to say about this. Well, in terms of what attracts people to Steve Snow, right. I, I, I think both his uh, cheerful countenance, but also his enthusiasm and his can-do attitude. He was a person who just got things done. And I think the secret to success in life is taking whatever comes to you and doing it well. And whether they were big things or little things, whether they were things that attracted attention from other people or not, Steve did them well and did them to the best of his ability. So it's been wonderful to watch where he's gone and what he's done, but I think most of it is doing little things well and then bigger opportunities come to you. Thank you, Carl. I, I'd like to give Patrick Mason the last word. You mentioned the distinguished Leonard Arrington Chair of uh, Mormon History. He's just, uh, he's with us as well. Patrick, uh, what, what, what would be your observation of Elder Snow and his time as a church historian and recorder? Well, Elder Snow was uh, just phenomenal. And he, as he said, he's not a professional historian, but he immediately earned the trust of, of the professional historical community. Uh, because of his trustworthiness, his curiosity, his intelligence, but also his willingness to listen to other people who were experts. As he said, he wasn't a professional historian, but, but the way that he put trust in other people meant that they reciprocated that trust and trusted him as a leader. And, and I've always seen that as one of his really uh, premier qualities. Thank you, Professor Mason. We've come to the end of our hour. I'd just like to say in close uh, that... Uh, we're honoring you today uh, as our distinguished executive alumnus. It's the highest award that the Huntsman School can offer. It's entirely justified. Uh, even if you weren't my good friend from 50 years ago, <laughs> would be giving you this award. Uh, our mission is to develop leaders of distinction in the worlds of commerce and public affairs. And you have fulfilled that mission in an exemplary way for uh, the last 50 years. We're very honored to have you as an alumnus of Utah State. Congratulations, Stephen. Uh, thank, thank you, you very so much, much. Thank you. Thank you.